Hello and welcome to another episode of Sushi and the Swordfish. You're here with Sushi again and we're looking at the movies I watched in October of 2021. So we're going to jump right in as you've probably already know all of these tiers at this point. Let's see where we get to. I see. Got to make a quick change here. There we go. Fix those up and we're getting started. All right. First off, we have Gotham Knight. This was Batman Gotham Knight and I actually got the three Batman movies here in the bottom left corner. Um, they were all in like a co compilation of some kind. And I can't remember which I watched first. Not that it really matters, but Gotham Knight was neat. It was basically this sort of compilation of people's experience and thoughts on what Batman is and what Batman means to them. And there's a couple, they're basically like a bunch of short films put together, done by a few different people, animated differently and so forth. Um, there was one where like there's a cop or there's this huge fire and Batman seems to be almost um, mythical. And then there's another one where Batman's chasing this guy down. Like it's just, it's done really neat. It's it's really cool. There's basically a, a, a common villain between all of them, which is sort of like this shadow villain. Um, so I liked it. I thought it was a, a really interesting way of presenting Batman. And I think if you have experienced a lot of different Batman media, this was a, a neat way to look at the character kind of through other people's eyes rather than just us being presented the story. It was really told by different people in Gotham, giving us an idea of what Batman means to the city and to them. So it goes in the big money, big prize, I love it, category. Next, we have Batman Under the Red Hood. Yeah, again, not too bad. I think I'm going to go with... Oh, this one's tough. It was it was good. It, it was good. And the idea of bringing back Jason Todd must have been kind of challenging uh, as a writer. Now, obviously, it came, came from the comic book. I, I think I'm going to go with OK USA. I think, unfortunately, it's slightly, it was a little bit forgettable to me. It's it's certainly not bad by any stretch. The animation was good. The character development was done well. But I, I just think it was okay. If I had to recommend, I think Gotham Knight was something a little bit more unique in its approach. And it was a really kind of a different sort of, um, it, its objective was different in presenting what Batman is. Whereas Batman Under the Red Hood is far more like a point A to point B type Batman story. All right, after that, one more animated Batman film here, Batman Year One. It is going in the big money, big prizes. I love it. I'm pretty familiar with the uh, the original graphic novel by Frank Miller, and it's again much beloved by many people. And so to see it in animated form was really neat. Um, one of the most iconic parts of the book is when Batman comes to a dinner which has many Gotham socialites who have been taking advantage of the city for lack of a better word and he tells them they will no longer feast on the city and he covers their heated plate like there's a little fire that's burning with um with a top and then burns it out like it covers it so that it no longer burns and it's just the imagery of Batman's face like the lighting and so forth and it's done really well in the animated film as well and I thought it was great it was it was a really cool to see it animated and I think they did a good job of capturing the spirit of the graphic novel into an animated form after that we have Boogie Nights <laughs> Boogie Nights is a it's such an interesting movie. I, I do really enjoy it and I, I contemplate putting it in my top dog category. It has so many good actors in it. Everybody's really into their parts. Like they, they fit their parts so well. Um, maybe the most ridiculous character in the entire movie might be John C. Riley. He just, <laughs> he's so, he's so obnoxious and ridiculous. The entire way through the movie but you can't help but like him because he's such a goofball but I think Don Cheadle probably puts in the most sort of underrated performance in the movie he's not in it a lot but 
the struggle he goes through to kind of bring his life back into, I guess, if you will, a normal life. Um, he's he's just a likable character. You, you root for him. You really want him to be able to succeed. And Burt Reynolds is really good in this. He's, I, I think I read or saw an interview of him saying he was not interested in the movie and he thought it was bad and, and so forth, but he was getting a lot of accolades. And I, I think he did put in a good performance. All right. Um, I see we have Madagascar 3 and 2 flip-flopped here. I think I'll go with 2 first. Um, I think this one's called Back to Africa. It was it was decent. It was it was okay. I'm just going to put in the okay pile. I don't have a ton to say about this movie. It was fun enough. Um, and it had some interesting characters. Um, Alec Baldwin is in it. And <laughs> his character is pretty fun. No doubt. But... Again, I think the Madagascar movies, they're fine. I think kids probably would enjoy them. They're, they're, they're funny enough jokes and so forth. But for adults, you, I don't think you'll go in it and feel completely as if it was a waste of time. But it's not probably going to leave a really strong impression on you, potentially. And oddly enough, I the third movie probably shouldn't have been that good. And it might probably not be rated that well compared to some of the others I would assume I found myself really enjoying it for some reason I, I thought it was neat that it carried on from the back to Africa care uh, story that one thing that they do a good job is all these movies basically are back to back like one movie ends and the next movie just picks up right where that other movie left off essentially and this movie they basically are stuck trying to get back to New York from Europe um, and they get on a train with a bunch of circus performing animals. And I don't know what it was. I just, I really liked it. If I remember, I think Brian Cranston, I think, plays, I believe his name is Vitali, the tiger. But it's so colorful. The last 20 minutes is, is just this explosion of color to your senses. It's, it's actually quite fun. I was surprised. Next, we have Mortal Kombat. This is a new Mortal Kombat movie so even though it shares the same title as the original one from the 1990s it is a new movie um, it is a little misleading uh, a lot of the posters and the, even the box art has Sub-Zero and Scorpion on it um, they are in the movie obviously but to a limited capacity the movie does end up focusing on a bunch of other characters such as Jack, Sonya, Cole is a new character, for film at least, um, and it's okay. Liu Kang's in it, as is um, Raiden, of course, and who am I missing? Kung Lao, um, and sorry, and as well as Kano, and Kano probably steals the whole movie. <laughs> the actor does a great job as Kano. He's having a lot of fun, um, and once he gets his little laser eye thing going is <laughs> he's having a blast literally is it's fun he, he really makes up anytime he's on screen he has a great screen presence um and then scorpion and sub-zero kind of bookend the film they are in the beginning of the movie and then there's a gap in time and then they show up at the end as well and so they definitely kind of steal the show from the martial arts perspective they're really fun once they're on screen and it's quite exciting to see them uh, once they're on screen and um, Scorpion is a uh, very liked and well-loved character from the Mortal Kombat franchise. And I think he does get some pretty good um, screen time in this movie. En enough to hopefully satisfy most fans. As a whole, the movie itself is just okay. It's acted well enough. It could have gone way worse. And it's certainly not a bad movie. Next we have Overlord. Which was, uh, I, I just totally on a whim happened to see the movie, was wondering what it was, looked at the back, was like, okay, this seems to be World War II zombies. And essentially that's what it is. It's, it was okay. It was, it wasn't bad. It was, it starts off kind of interesting and you, you get really engrossed in the general idea of the, what the movie would be. It's, I think it's categorized as war, horror, but the horror elements don't go really off the deep end of trying to jump scare you. They're just more graphic in nature of, okay, it's zombies. You kind of have an expectation of what's going to happen when 
it's a zombie movie. So it's decent enough. It's it's okay. Next we have Philadelphia. Okay, I like I like Philadelphia quite a bit. Uh, big money, big prizes. I love it. Um, I you know I didn't really see this when it came out. I assume at the time it might have been considered groundbreaking or at least trying to open the discussion and bring attention to you know what are human rights despite what your gender might be despite what your um, sort of interests maybe despite who you love all of these sort of things get brought up in this movie to some degree um, Tom Hanks is, acts really great in this movie uh, Denzel Washington puts in a you know solid performance as well they're really got great chemistry on screen I thought um, the Denzel Washington character I can't remember what his name is now but it's interesting he I think he gets to a level of tolerance in it like with his character but I don't know if he necessarily gets to a level of acceptance or even cherishing or um, you know I guess having a strong relationship he does I think his relationship with the Tom Hanks character is built primarily on the mutual respect as lawyers and I think he respects him as a person but I think he's more interested in upholding the law I think that piece comes up because there's a couple of scenes where he has some pretty derogatory things to say early on and even as the film gets laid in, I, I still don't necessarily know if his character, and I don't know if this is purposely he's playing this character this way, but I still don't know if he truly cares about the plight of the Tom Hanks character. Um, and Antonio Banderas is in this as well as Tom Hanks' partner. I, I'm not sure about that. And I don't know if it's done purposely to be somewhat vague or somewhat on the fence still about like, okay, does he really care about this person? Is he just doing this because, and he's not really doing it for the money. I think that's uh, quite clear. I think he just wants to uphold the, the um, sanctimony of the law. The law shouldn't be overrun uh, based on, you know, the way he interprets it essentially. So uh, as a whole though, there, there are some quite strong moving moments in the movie. And as I said, I think the Tom Hanks characters does seem quite likable. Um, yeah, I, it's, it, I think there's probably better representation uh, now with film uh, that I'm probably not aware of. But this at the time would have definitely have been, uh, you know, as I said, probably somewhat groundbreaking or at least a stepping stone to where we can open the conversation about the at least from a legal side of things, you know, the rights that everybody should be allowed to have. All right, after that, we have Rocky II. And I think I've already made mention that on any given day, any Rocky movie could probably be in a top dog category. I, oh, Rocky II doesn't get a lot of respect. I think a lot of people who enjoy film or really dissect film or have understanding of how film is made and so forth or film critics put rocky one right at the top of the heat like if there's no sort of if ands or buts the other movies can be fun and so forth but rocky one is the dramatic film of the series it's it's the the benchmark and rocky 2 kind of gets the the whipping status for that if I think Stallone wanted to keep things somewhat dramatic, but he wanted to add a little more of that action element to the movie. And it doesn't quite reach the heights of either. But I like Rocky too. I think it's it's a kind of a feel good movie. You know, it's it. I think that might be part of the problem is people are like, well, Rocky one is more realistic. Rocky two starts to get a little bit into the fantastical, not as much as three and four, but does start to kind of bend into that even though there are still elements of dr um, dramatic uh, scenes and so forth in the movie um, that end credit theme song is probably my favorite song out of the entire rocky franchise except for the rocky 3 apollo creed and rocky 
boxing match in the last uh, two minutes of the film. Those are probably my two favorite songs in the entire franchise. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think Rocky II should be kind of given as much of a whipping status as it gets. I, I think obviously Rocky V probably takes the most beating out of all. But Rocky II certainly seems to be on most people's lower half of the Rocky films. But I put it in the big money, big prize, I love it category. Next we have Spy. I'm going to go in the OK USA category. I could probably be swayed to put it a step higher. Again, didn't really have much knowledge of this movie. I'd heard a little bit about it. I heard, I'm not super familiar with Melissa McCarthy. I, she seems to be somewhat divisive. It seems that some people really, really don't like her brand of humor and others really like it. Um, I thought she was good in this. I thought, you know, she's not totally um, the type of comedian maybe I'm used to to um, watching or laughing at, but I thought she played this movie pretty good. And um, there's some really funny parts. Both um, Jason Statham is in this, and he's really good in this because <laughs> he is so, so overbearing in his character. And then Jude Law is really good in it too because he sort of um, plays a sort of cheeky James Bondish type spy, whereas the Jason Statham one is just this rough and tough and I think he's constantly talking about how much battle damage he's had, talking about being stabbed in the neck with a, I don't know, a, a piece of, I don't know, fiberglass that was broken off of, a, I don't know, a roof or whatever. He's got, he's got all these ridiculous, while on fire, while, while trying to float on a raft that has air blowing out of it. And, for 150 kilometers and it's just he's just always trying to one-up the miss melissa mccarthy character for no reason she's just she was never a field agent until this this point in time in the movie i can't, I can't believe he's his tall tales even are realistic um the outtakes are actually quite funny because they especially between the, the melissa mccarthy and Statham characters, they, they have a hard time not laughing at each other because it's just so ridiculous. Yeah, it was it was fun. It was a decent movie. It was it was much better than I had anticipated. Next we have The Mechanic. This is a remake of the Charles Bronson movie. It's going right in the OK USA pile. Not bad. Um, follows quite closely to the Charles Bronson movie. Um, almost exactly. A little bit different. Um, I don't recall if this movie, I don't think it quite has the same 16, 17 minute opening sequence of um, the same film not having any talking, but it's decent. It, it was not too bad for a remake. It was, it was still pretty fun. Next we have Toy Story of Terror, Toy Story. It's going in the OK USA pile. Not bad. Basically a short film, essentially. Um, still pretty fun. And it's nice to always revisit the Toy Story characters. They are surprisingly likable and lovable. Um, I, for me, I think before I watched Toy Story, I didn't think I would enjoy it just based on the aesthetic. And then you watch it and it's it's quite endearing. And this is decent. It's a fun little little movie. And the, I think this has the Rexy party, what do they call them? Party, party dino or something like that. That, that one's pretty fun. That's followed by Triple Threat, which stars some pretty awesome uh, modern, I guess modern day, if you will, sort of just present day martial arts actors. Uh, you have Tony Ja in this. You have um, Scott Adkins, Michael Jai White. I know I'm missing a ton. Um, I can never remember the actor from The Raid is in this. And... It, uh, Michael Bisping from the UFC is in this. It's got all that you would want from an actor standpoint. The film is just okay. Um, it just doesn't seem as though there's enough for them to do on screen half the time. Um, I will say it is nice to see Scott Adkins play a villain. Uh, he's typically a hero in most of the movies. So it's nice to see that flip-flop. And again, it's not bad. It, it's got all the star power you could have possibly want, but it's just kind of the flow is a little bit wonky and it's a little bit slower than you might expect. And the action sequences, again, no, I am not obviously talented enough to 
coordinate or be in any of those action sequences. But I guess they, they didn't quite wow me as I guess I might anticipate they might with the type of actors that are in the movie. But still worth a watch if you enjoy martial arts films. Next we have Winnie the Pooh Springtime for Rue. Uh, okay, USA. I, I don't have much to say about this. I, I don't know how many Winnie the Pooh I think I've watched. Two or three at this point. Um, it's decent. It's fine. There's, it's not too bad. I mean, it's... It's probably, again, a bit ultimately forgettable, but I don't think it deserves a stink rating or, or no rating, but I'm going to put it in there. And finally, we have Wrath of Man. I'm going to throw this here in the big money, big prize. I love it. This was actually a really cool movie. I, I, again, didn't know much about it. I just was sort of browsing for a new state the movie, saw this was a really new movie, and thought, okay, let's see what this one's all about. Uh, this is a Guy Ritchie film. And so I haven't seen a ton of Guy Ritchie films, but I do know he has a very distinct style. Um, I don't know if you want to call it like a very British gritty style, um, but I thought this was a really cool movie. It was really well done. Statham plays his character you know, as well as he typically does, and it's got a good flow to it. I like the pacing. Um, there's a couple of elements where you're like kind of a little bit eyebrow raising of like, Eh, really okay but we're watching a movie so you know you can kind of quell some of that disbelief and just be like you know do we really want to see all of those mundane things happening in between probably not we want to be entertained as a as an audience so I, it's it's good it's um, a little bit different than what you might expect of Jason Satham but I did enjoy it and that is our look of the October 2021 movies I watched. As I said, a little bit longer list this month. So thanks for joining me. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts, see if you agree with some of these or not. Um, yeah, it would be really curious to see. Uh, I'm still looking straight at Boogie Nights thinking it needs to go on Top Dog. I think I'm going to leave it. Uh, I don't think I'm going to move it. But as I said, I could probably be swayed on a few of these movies. However, Love to get your thoughts in the comments. Let me know which of these movies were some of your favorites or you'd like to put lower ranked. And looking forward to seeing you down that road at the November movies. Take care.